one of the earliest lesson I learned as an inventor is that a great invention also needs to have great timing. You, in front of you, are uh, a pair of aircraft parts that I both designed and produced. I was invited to change this part in the A4 Skyhawk fighter from aluminium into carbon composite to save weight. I underestimated the difficulty involved and I spent two years of my life developing and producing these two pieces in my own uh, basement at home. After my four kids go to sleep, in the wee hours of the morning, I will be working away. The good news was that two years later, I managed to produce two pairs, one of which was tested to failure, and the second set was stuck up on an actual airplane and flew around Singapore for a couple of weeks. So what's the bad news? Well, two weeks after I succeeded, the Air Force announced that they are going to withdraw all the Skyhawk fighters to be replaced by F-16s. <laughs> Perfect timing. I went into medical device invention shortly after the death of my older sister, Angela. She died of lung cancer. At that time, the tumour was growing right next to an artery, a major artery. So the doctors could not operate on it. In my discussion with the doctors, I kept asking, can't you do something to make a device that is placed right next to the tumour and then radiate continuously against the tumour to kill it? The doctors say, great idea, but nobody has done that before. <laughs> it was then that I realised that an engineer like myself can contribute towards finding ideas to cure sickness and disease. This is one of the earlier inventions that I made. I myself suffer from kidney stones. From birth, I had a defect, and throughout my life, I've been producing a lot of kidney stones. If they were diamonds, I would be a very rich man. <laughs> Too bad. But I can tell you that when a kidney stone travels from the kidney down to the bladder, it has to go through the ureter. It's a long tube. And if it ever gets stuck in the ureter, and that happened to me quite a few times, it is excruciatingly painful. It is also life-threatening. You need to immediately get treated for it. And one of the ways to avoid this is to put a stent into the ureter, um, and then when there is no more stones, to, th to take out the, the stents. After discussing the urologist, I thought it would be a great idea that if you insert the stent in, and after it has been used, let it dissolve by itself, and then you don't have to have the second uh, procedure of pulling the whole stent out. And trust me, it's not a great experience. So I worked with the urologist, very enthusiastic guy, I come to learn that doctors all have wonderful things they want to do, but they couldn't do it. So an engineer helps them to, 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 to develop, invent it. And we succeeded. And we tested it. Uh, we included uh, testing in animals. It was a great device. Then we started looking for investors, and that was when I learned my first lesson. That's a great invention also requires a great market size. Market size matters because if it's not big enough, nobody's interested in investing in it. Great solution, great problem, but no investors. Sometimes, inventions need to move fast in order to be successful. You have the first mover's advantage. But to do that, an inventor needs to be willing to share his idea early on with people who can help him to move fast, and sometimes, that is a problem because inventors want to keep everything to themselves. Um, this was a device that I invented with my student. It all started in the morning when we were chatting away over coffee. And then we pulled out, I remember, the serviette and then started sketching some you know, uh, pictures onto the serviette. Um, it was a problem 
that surgeons had. You see, when a surgeon operates, he needs to keep the surgical wound open. In the operating theatre, they require two nurses. That's very expensive. One on the left, one on the right, pulling the, the wound open with a retractor manually. We said, what if we replace this manual way of doing it with an adhesive that is attached onto the skin? Obvious enough, it's no rocket science. But nobody has ever filed a patent for that, you see. So in the morning, we sketched it. The next morning, uh, my student actually bought half a pig, of course, they, um, to, to the lab. And then we did some tests. And we discovered that actually it worked really well. I decided then that we had to move fast. So what I did was to contact a company in Irvine, California. And they had the expertise to make good prototypes file the IP as fast as possible, and then start commercializing it, all in one month. I could do that only because I was willing to share these ideas with them at the risk of them further developing other things themselves. But it did give me a first mover's advantage. I then went on to work on something that has a bigger market. Well, if first it doesn't succeed, you try again. So the stent that I developed for, for the kidney stone uh, didn't have a big enough market. So I started talking to cardiologists. And then I discovered that one of the big problems is an unmet need that they face, is that when you do stenting, uh, it's a perfect idea to have a stent that will completely dissolve. But first, let me explain how a stent works. When your blood vessel is clogged up, what a cardiologist or radiologist do is to insert a balloon into the place where your, your blockage is, expand the balloon so that your blockage is open, and then insert a scaffold called a stent to hold up the opening. Now, what people don't know is this, that once the stent is in, after a few months, the blood vessel, a very clever living thing, uh, actually remembers its shape, and after a few months, if you take the stent away, it will retain the new shape. So the stent then becomes a liability for life. Why life? Because the metal stents that you put in cannot be taken out once it's inside. And for the rest of your life, you have to worry about the possibility of blood clotting, for example. So after talking to him, I told him that I had a brilliant idea some time ago. Uh, we could develop a stent that actually can be inserted in, and not only that, it can expand exactly where it's wanted once it's located to the size that is required so that it will not move after that, and then stay there for a couple of months. After that, it will start slowly, but in a programmed way, dissolves itself and disappear. Actually, it dissolves into a material that is like milk, and your body absorbs it very nicely. So that was a brilliant idea. What is interesting is this. I actually took the new idea from a different industry. You see, in the microelectronics industry, they have been working on what we call a multi-layer polymer structure, layer by layer. And that gives you some unique properties. I borrowed that idea and I planted it into the biomedical device, and it worked perfectly. So you have a stand that is really small, made of polymer, insert into the blood vessel, located exactly where you want it, and because it's multi-layer, it's able to expand exactly at your body temperature into the diameter that it should, and it stays there. And wonderfully, after a few months, it begins to crack up layer by layer, very safe. So, this was quite a long process. Um, that was the easy part. I discovered that the path part was finding people to put money into this project. This was about 2003, 2002. And in those days, Singapore VC companies were not used to investing in biomedical devices and so on. So my colleague, uh, Subhu Vega Traman, and myself, both flew by ourselves to California, Silicon Valley. And for two whole days, we walked through El Camino, uh, 
Mountain View, uh, uh, Palo Alto, knocking at the doors of at least 10 VC companies. You know, some of them, we didn't even last five minutes. <laughs> we were just introducing ourselves and say, okay, thank you, we are not interested. <laughs> Thankfully, when we flew back, we discovered that one company, that's all you need, was interested. Well, 14 years later, 50 million US dollars at least, investment later, uh, the stand is now in several hundred patients all around the world. Thankfully, no adverse events. Uh, and thank you. And it all came because we talked to a cardiologist. It's always good to ask questions, to talk, and then to find out what are the needs, and then you get the solution. This last example I'm giving is one that I have a great passion for. Uh, I get to learn things every day when I talk to people. And some years back when I talked to an eye surgeon, I discovered the horror of a disease called glaucoma. Glaucoma is a terrible disease because there's no cure. What happens is that as your eyeball uh, gets high pressure and it's, it damages your, your nerves, your eye nerves, so you start going blind irreversible. Even if you reduce the pressure, the disease does not go away. There is an existing cure, and that is to put eye drops 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 52 weeks a year. Nobody can do that all the time, can you? <laughs> you will forget. And the terrible thing is that if you forget, if you don't do it, you get more blind. Day by day, week by week. So we thought of an idea to inject the drug contained in very small particles. It's got to be small because if you put it in your eye and it's big enough, you will see the particles, you won't see people. So we started with nanospheres, so small you can't see it, injected into the eye, and uh, as it slowly releases the drug over a period of three to six months, um, the pressure of the eyeball reduces itself. Uh, it's currently now undergoing uh, clinical trials, but you know, again, it's the same thing. Start ask, talking and asking questions and you will discover that there's many things um, that need solution. And when you have two disciplines or three coming together, you get an answer for it. So, um, one more thing I learned. You know, discovering a new drug is horrendously expensive. It's billions of dollars. For this project, what we did was to use an off-pattern drug. We allowed to use it. We delivered an old drug in a new way, and we found out that it's as good as a new drug. Now, this actually gives hope because there are many off-pattern drugs, and uh, some of you might give it a try. List out all the off-pattern drugs and find a new way to deliver an old drug so that you can have new efficacies. Now, let me share with you some of the simple lessons I learned in my life as I grow as an inventor. Uh, the first and most obvious example is keep things simple. If it is too difficult to explain, it's too difficult to use. <laughs> right? Any design, the more complicated it is, the more likely it is to fail. If there are many parts, there will be many failures. Keep it simple. The second lesson that I learned is that innovation and invention is not having an answer that is looking for a question. Uh, it's tempting to do that. Here's a clever answer. Where's the problem? Huh? Before you start talking, start listening. What is the problem? Once you know the problem, getting the answer will be fairly logical. And that will help you a long way to reduce the amount of time you need to bring your invention from beginning to a product that is sellable and successful. Do what you are good at. Isn't that obvious? Yes, but sometimes you get misled by yourself. An inventor has a certain skill set, a certain can-do attitude, and a certain personality. When he becomes, at the same time, a CEO of a startup company, things can get a bit awry because the startup company 
the CEO requires a different kind of skill sets, a different discipline, different personality. It is the exception to the rule that an inventor, who, a good inventor, is also a good CEO of a startup company. So my advice to many inventors is, hey, do what you are good at. Invent and continue inventing. Let others do the running of the company. It's no fun, trust me. <laughs> Walk away from a good idea to a better idea. People talk about being passionate with your ideas. It can be costly. If you have one idea that is great, after some time, it doesn't take traction. It becomes only a good idea. After some time, it becomes only an idea that nobody cares. Be humble. Be realistic. If one idea doesn't work, after some time, Walk away from that good idea. There are better ideas. The whole world is filled with great ideas. You don't have a monopoly of it. So not, do not be afraid. If you don't let go, you cannot move on further. And the last advice I have is don't invest in yourself. <laughs> I have invented a lot of things. I never put my money in my invention. I don't trust myself <laughs> because I'm emo emotionally involved. I will always think my ideas are the best. And that's a bad idea when you do investments. When somebody else says that your idea is good and they put money in your idea, your idea is really good. So, in conclusion, please don't borrow money from your mother-in-law. <laughs> Thank you very much.